tonight, uh, Cora Brooks Poetry mm -hmm. Reading. My name is Steve Gold. I'm the president of the Board of Trustees of the Color Cover Steve Library. Gold. And Poem City is brought to you by the Color Cover Library, but we couldn't do it without our wonderful sponsors, the National Life Group Foundation, Vermont Humanities Council, Hunger Mountain Co-op, the Vermont College of Fine Arts, and the Poetry Society of Vermont. Um, we have two, we're, we're pleased and honored to have two poets reading Cora Brooks' poetry tonight. Chard Nord is the Poet Laureate of Vermont. He is the author of six books of poetry, uh, Interstate, the University of Pittsburgh Press, The Double Truth, University of Pittsburgh Press, Speaking in Turn, a collaboration with Tony Sanders, The Noman Press, uh, Night Mowing, the University of Pittsburgh Press, Sharp Golden Thorn, Marsh Hawk Press, and Asleep in the Fire, University of Alabama Press. He is also the author of a book of essays and interviews with senior American poets titled Sad Friends, Drowned Lovers, Stapled Songs, Conversations and Reflections on 20th Century American Poets, the Marwick Press. He co-founded the New England College MFA program in poetry in 2001, where he also served as the program director for six years. Chard is a professor of English and creative writing at Providence College and lives in Putney with his wife, Liz. Our second reader is Karen McCadden. Karen received an MFA from Warren Wilson College, and she is the author of Landscape with Plywood Silhouettes, New Issues, which received the 2013 New Issues Poetry Prize, as well as the 2015 Vermont Book Award. McCadden has received fellowships and awards from the National Endowment of the Arts, the Sustainable Arts Foundation, and the Vermont Arts Council, among others. Karen teaches at Montpelier High School, and she lives in South Burlington with her husband, Cliff. And with that, I will invite whichever of you is going to be the first reader to come and begin the evening for us. Steve, and thank you to the Kellogg Covered Library and Poem City for creating such a wonderful container for poems, for everyone's poems. I'm just going to introduce this reading really quickly and say a few things about Cora, and then Chart will read from her published work, and then I've been rifling through her boxes for some unpublished work that uh, I'll read second, so that's been quite a treat. Um, I called this reading Six Poems as Useful as Spoons because as Cora was dying, and she's probably said this to a hundred people because I, I just love the way she riffs on language and I, I think she fall, fell in love with uh, phrasing regularly. She said she wanted to have written six poems in her life that were as useful as spoons. <laughs> and I thought that was the most beautiful thing. Um, and so she said, if you, because I asked her what to do with her poems and what should we do with her work, and she said, I would like you to make a small book with six poms in it that are as useful as spoons. So you go through those boxes and you find six. <laughs> so we've whittled it down to probably a 40 minute reading tonight and uh, we'll see how we do. Um, and my favorite poem of hers was, uh, Forgive These Words, They Are Not Birds. Hit the whimsical in love with the natural world. Unpretentious, Cora Brooks's poems hold her life close to her chest. And even as they are somewhat private, they build a portrait of Cora, the pacifist, the artist, the fierce friend, and the great lover of the moon and rivers and shadows and light. Most of her publications were in the late 1970s. Uh, she had books put out through Acorn Press, and individual poems were in Our Bodies, Ourselves, a remarkable place for a poem to live. American Poetry Review, Southern Poetry Review, the Boston Review of the Arts, and in Plowshares. Um, and I'm going to read her own bio that she wrote. I found it in one of the boxes, just to tell us who she was. And I think most of us here know who Cora Brooks was, so I'll just do this so we can hear her voice. Cora Brooks, it's in the third person, but she wrote it about herself. Cora Brooks has said her poems in public on more than 300 occasions at colleges, in coffee houses, on village greens, and in town halls, sometimes with music. Poems of hers have been published in numerous journals, magazines, and anthologies, including Plowshares and the American Poetry Review. 
Essays and book reviews of hers have been published in Behind, by Behind the Times and the Times Argus. A play of hers, The Moon is a Skull with Dark Wings, was produced in New York City off-Broadway. Books of her poems have been published by Mellon Poetry Press, New Victoria Publishers, and Acorn Press. For 35 years, she has taught at every level from nursery school to graduate school. In the 1980s, she co-founded with other Vermont women, Battered Women's Services for Vermont, and particularly Orange County. In May of 2001, 22 of her poems went on permanent display in an exhibit of weaving and sculpture by Andrea Wasserman and Elizabeth Billings in the new wing of Burlington International Airport. She is a student of painting. Her paintings have appeared in numerous shows in Barry, Randolph, and Montpelier, Vermont. She is a non-violent activist. Cora is the mother of two grown children and grandmother to three children. I remember asking her for a bio for the anthology that Chard put together with Sydney Lee, and her bio was really, really, really long and included this really lush description of her life. And I think that that's a place to stop. She lived a really rich life, and I believe she, we could all raise our hands if we were touched by her when she was here, right? Yeah, oh, there it is. Okay, so Chard's going to read from her, um, her published work, and then I'll get up and read some other poems. Maybe there are poems we haven't heard before, maybe they have. Thank you for coming. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Karen, for all the hard work you've done um, in putting this together and, um, and spending all the time you did with Cora you know, at the end of her life. I, I know it meant everything to her. And I, I know what an important voice she was here in Montpelier and, and around Vermont and, and in the country as well. Um, she was, I think, she was both a quiet and loud presence. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's a testimony to her work that, um, that you're all good. If you want to you know, you keep hearing it, it's that news that stays news. Um, so it's a great honor for me to be here tonight and read uh, some of her poems to you, which um, I, I didn't know really uh, very well until Sid Lee and I started putting this book together, Roads Taken, a Contemporary Vermont Poetry, which is here in the library. So there are about 96 poets dating back to Frost in that, in that book, two poems each of all the poets, and uh, she's, she's in there. And I, I, I got to know her um, then when we were, when we were perusing uh, poetry for that book. Um, so I'm going to read, um, I guess, about 15 poems of, of hers, maybe a few more. I'm going to start with this book, Poems for a Book of Hours. Do you know this little little book? Um, these are very short poems, and I think they um, demonstrate her the power of her restraint, her belief in economy. January, the tree once green became the log, the fire, the ashes, the air. February, winter, you startled us with our own curved shadows bending the angles of bare light around us. March, the wind would sharpen its tools on the gray stone days, but the stones became smooth and the tools slipped away. April, above each loose river, banners of birds. <coughs> May, sun met hills, and hills went their way. June, summer, you wound, loud, you wound light spiral stairs, placing bundles of light in our arms, railing Railings of vines, a wreath of bright air. <coughs> July. Fireflies swirling high aspired to stars. August. A, slight, a slice of light shifted places with a sliver of darkness. Clouds unwrapped a storm in the unwalled meadows of air. September, 
We return to school, or we remember we carried summer on our backs. October, autumn, you turn each leaf into a letter inviting the wind to its own celebration. And her last poem in this series, rather than November and December, attached to her axis, the same earth that would fling us would swerve to curb under us to gather us around. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, she's rare in the sense that she, um, she was an activist. She believed in getting out of her study and um, marching and resisting when it was important to do that. And she was a good friend of Grace Paley's. And, um, uh, set an important social and political example, and yet she was a poet at the same time. Uh, so she's one of those rare writers who's also so important as um, as an example uh, to, uh, to others, and had great courage in all that she did. This next book, wonderful title, A Cow is a Woman. I'm going to read a few poems from here and then from her other book, Heather in a Jar. If we are in our lives, we never forget that we are living, but always, if only to remember this gathering of air, where the moon spreads and unspreads herself to the dark, above a world that would fling us until we became her arms. Walking through a forest or through a neighborhood of trees, we imagine the lungs of leaves and that the twigs and sticks that lie beneath in their different silence are sighing, almost praying to a wind that could stir them or the floor that would break them so that even in deafness they would be heard. We would ask who we are and why we are here. While whipping our backs, a rain comes down upon us as though it thinks we are the earth. The sea. There is an environment which nearly demands falling in love. The sea, open and wide, with fields nearby, chicory and rose hip, sand, ledges, rocks. I want to meet you here having known you all this time for the first time. <clears throat> the map. The map says very little. It does not tell about the detours, nor can it predict an expression of sky. Three dark birds, then the migration does not indicate which things are living and dying or the things already dead. It does not mention that next to the trees there is a river washing its own wound, loosening itself from a swift and restless dreams, a wall made of stones hauled from a meadow, vines twisting towards a steep light or how long I would wait for you here. <clears throat> this is called The Visit. Look, the play we are in has no intermissions between the days. And when it is over, I could lose the ticket stuff. <laughs> you might soothe me with balloons, even though riding on the bicycle will be more difficult. If you show me the yellow legal pads that are your life, spread them all over the floor. I promise not to walk on any page while I look for my name. All I came to show you was this drawing book. 
filled with a diagrammed people, ripped in places, and the inflexible linoleum block carved twice to make one print. How else will you know the mother in this dance is asleep, sucking her thumb? And when she wakes up, she will say, look, all this time, there was hair growing under my arms. <laughs> I love her sensibility. <laughs> love song of a species. Think of long, tall animals making love into themselves, breaking themselves together, swallowing each other's air, each other's songs. Think of these animals not knowing their species, their strangeness. Think of them trying to tell each other all day long with words. Think then of the most natural way of saying, I love you, eyes, mouth, a place. There is a place that has no thoughts. Think of something, a thing that cannot think inside a place, that cannot contain thoughts. Think of these things together, not thinking. Think of the most natural way to think of this, then unthink everything that follows from that. Then sleep, a sleep in which all dreams and these words are stolen from the dream you are having. You can imagine the difficulties. You can imagine the difficulties the question itself was at first impossible to phrase. Lacking sleep, away from clocks, the dimensions of time became the walls of a well into which we climbed. Without orders or expectations, we remained patient during the descent. The deeper we went, the easier it became to forgive. Several of us, for several days now, have been asking for news of our own survival. in a winter season. When we are seized by the spine in a winter season, our children come to us pale, flickering and dancing, indelible. One by one they ask to walk beside us. Poise, they're impatient. Poise, they're impatience. Bow and slip away. And this is this is the last poem from this uh, from this book um, that I've chosen. It's called Endure. You will come home. Build out the bridges in your mind with blocks, and your son and daughter believe you are playing with them. I will tell you all the things that happened while you were gone. The telephone calls. The one for you at 8 a.m., the one for me much later. We will speak of attractions. I will tell you that when I met you, I never met anyone like you before. You will say that wore off. I will say truer now than before. You will not be sure. You will seem interested, as though you are learning it for the first time. I will tell you of the light waking me through the window you made for the moon. I will tell you I've had fantasies and made love to myself while reading a book. You will ask what the fantasies are. I will say they are better. They are of the past and future lives. You will go to bed, but you will be sure to leave the light like the moon on. And I will write this down so you can read it sometime and remember who we are. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm going to let Karen come up now and read some more poems. <coughs> Thank you.
here. Um, and I, I don't think I'll be able to read them all, but I'm going to just file on and read them all. <laughs> this is a poem Cora often would say called Bird Song. A bird sings a song, song isn't long, sings it, never gets it wrong. <laughs> Reminder, every day I want to stay alive to find out how to. This cow, <clears throat> excuse me, this cow is a grandmother. Some think she is going to fall. The flock flies south. The cow walks north. She senses she is going the wrong way. She begins to turn around. By night, when she falls, she is mostly snow. Room. There is a room. In the room, there is a painting of the room. The only difference between the room and the painting of the room is that the people in the painting are hungry. <laughs> I'm so in love with her mix of humor and threat. <laughs> so I keep thinking of the, there's always a subtle threat underneath this humor and this whimsical way of looking at the world. Fish in the, in fish in the dark sky where the puff, I'm sorry. Fish in the dark sky where the pebbles are stars. Suppose before we were this, we were fish or plums, dust and seed to the wind, hurled here our hearts are in session. The earth pulls us on. Devotion. The vain moon uses so many seas, rivers, ponds, and puddles for her mirrors. A lot of these would make great tattoos. <laughs> Name. Once upon a time, there was a family name group. There was a family name group spelled Group. When they came to this country, the immigration officer spelled their name Grunge, Grudge, Judge, Grope, Grump, Gripe, Grime, and Crime, to show them who knew how to spell their names and what to call them. Really good poem. Yeah. Timely. Game. There is a pile of tokens. Some people used them for roving. Some people traded them for a hen or oats. It was a simple life, raw as a bite. There was loving and there was feuding. Sometimes you couldn't tell the difference. Has anyone dared you to quit? Don't. Loiter a while in the zoned areas make piles or sort them. I promised I was going to read poems I didn't think were published, and I realized that two of them were, so I'm going to skip them. <clears throat> house. I am the house, empty and huge, open and vacant. <coughs> I dream of dishes and glass, roses and glass, paper and glass, I dream of doors flung open and doors shutting out the night, which if it weren't pinned up high by the stars would drape over me like a flag over a casket. I dream of light splashed over the floor, of a fire smoke heaving up and out the chimney into the air. I dream of rooms and feet, sometimes the feet dance. Zero to five. What can we say to the face in the painting? Are we more alive than the paint? It may be the paint who moves us or makes us move. How the line for the building, which has been taken down, is moving on the page. It's chalk like rust, it's slow descent, it's wiggling and the chalky water. She says you can't be angry with them. It's like being angry with the fog. Little by little, she learned to paint. Little by little, she learned to read. Then, because she was a witch, she made up her own spells. And the building? Where has she gone? 
the boards put up in another pattern, the boards so few of them painted, but this building painted like rain and spring, rust and a creamy yellow, <clears throat> it was morning, the morning smelled like toast. It was afternoon, the afternoon smelled like fresh wash clipped to the line. Birds. There were birds in the tree, the color of the shed and the branch, brown and gray, maybe a little white, just a little, and black. The birds have feathers, they have feet, they hop and fly, flutter and settle, they settle on a tree. I come closer. They discuss this quietly among themselves. Then on the count of whatever they count to, or however they measure, they measure and signal, and as if all at once, they all leave except one stays, and one comes back, and one comes back to be with the one who came back to be with the one who stayed. <laughs> <laughs> There's this delightful recycling of images, um, such that when I was, I was going through the boxes, I started to lose track of which poems I had read already and which I hadn't. And then I discovered they were all over my house and then all over my classroom. And then I realized that some of them are inside other poems. The little poems are, become stanzas and the bigger poems. And so there's this great washing of imagination through all her work. She particularly seemed to like birds and the moon. <laughs> the moon is everywhere. Um, but also I love the, the poems that mention the laundry on the line. Another, a lot of real domestic images. Um, which I find really beautiful when people can see the domestic and in the domestic find the divine and find those moments of real inspiration. Um, <clears throat> the dish. The dish dreams of being stacked in a cupboard with 11 other dishes of the same size. The dish dreams of being chosen to be placed in a setting on the table. The dish dreams of the evening dinner party with candles on the table and linen napkins spread out like fans. The dish dreams of carrots and peas, potatoes and beans. The dish dreams of sauces and toast. The dish dreams of fish and lemons. Then the dream changes. People are fighting. Someone, a man, comes and shouts and hollers. A woman screams. The man picks up the dish and throws it across the room. The dish smashes against the wall and breaks into 14 pieces. The pieces get swept up and thrown out into the garbage and dumped into the ocean. Every piece, each fragment, dreams it is a shell. <laughs> Pandora's box. Linen and the discourse of rivers or rivers and the discourse of linen, or discourse and the linen of rivers. Squirrels and outgrown shoes, the upper slope of the moon and blue air. Pillows, beach rubble and hayseed, berries and cupped hands to drink the heavy rains, dust ripe for flying, and the wind or the leaves. If the tree had a mouth, if the tree had a mouth, would it speak? Would it ask a question? Would the tree sigh? Does the tree leave its leafy breath beside it, or does it toss it in the air? Does the tree make a wish to have leaves and the leaves come true? <laughs> the ground still diggable, the air like a blessing or grace before a feast, quiet and devotional. Then the wind comes snappy, the leaves crisp and well washed, some ready for flight, others hanging on by some tremulous stem to where they fit to twig or branch. The birches lean together as if someone might yell stop to all this touching with leaves. Let the light, its mighty bright tooth, bite down. This poem, um, I just want to say a quick thing about it because I, I cracked up when I read it in this, um, this manuscript called Boundary. And 
I thought it was finished on the page, and then the next page has, um, I think it's either the last line of the poem, or it is pretending that this sentence is its own poem, but it's very deliberately on the next page. So I'm going to sort of do a little like show and tell when it comes to this last line, because it could be either the last line or its own poem. <laughs> Go look. Go look for the moon. She's been losing weight. She's been hiding out behind the barn like a vagrant traveler. Go look at the trees, their crooked limbs held out like arms, their glossy leaves waving hello or goodbye like so many hands. Go look at the sky, its feathery clouds patient and silent as the down in your pillow under your sleep. Look up at the stars, their disarray, the light they spew. Go look at the stream, see how the water slackens, becomes a fugue. Catch a glimpse of the birds in their green sovereign courthouse or in the wide blue air. Dig in the earth for something buried or forgotten. Find something ordinary, an old clothesline. Put it to use. Hang this poem up to dry. <laughs> God, that's ridiculously good. <laughs> this, uh, okay, and there's a few, just a few more. Um, this is called Earth Heart, and there's an epigraph underneath the title To the Women, to the Woman of Vietnam Who is Dead, and Whose Five Children Are Dead, and Who Will Not. Even in a dream, let me hold one of the babies to the sky, which is never twice the same, and to her sisters everywhere. Mm -hmm. First the fire leapt from our hearts because our hearts were red. Then the fire flared from our eyes because our eyes had seen what the fire would not see. We did not dream. We did not wake. The fire took away those we would have touched. Suppose before we were this, we were plums or fish, dust and seed to the wind hurled here. Our hearts are in session. May this earth pull us on. And when the sea has gathered our bones and swirled them to shells, may it toss them back to shore for the great-grandchildren of our great-grandchildren to find. And this is one of the poems that has a couple of other poems inside it. Right, I already read the middle earlier, and then there's another poem, this, a couple of them end with the idea of the children and the great-grandchildren and, and the shells thrown back to shore. It's a really an image that keeps showing up. Um, spring. One shadow was the height of my arm stretched up, and another shadow was the height of my left shoulder, and flew through the house as if the house were a great tree, and they the quick birds within it. These shadows then go. In the dreams of these shadows, there are feathers, windows, and doors. One shadow flew through a window, and one flew through a door, but it was my own frozen shadow stood up from where I lay and dispersed itself to the night cold sky behind the northeast wall, and so long ago, flew back with only one wing broken. I think so many of the poems, the one wing broken is another image that keeps coming back. Um, so many of the poems are not overtly personal. You know, they, they feel intimate, but they're not overtly about, about the story of the self. And there's a few about her father, which I would have wanted to read. My father. I heard his voice years later, after he had died, call, I'm gone. It rang through his nose and came from his chest and throat. His voice came on the wind going south, almost a song. And he wasn't with his voice now. He had no body, no crumpled skin, no swollen toes, not feet, no hands, all gone from one thing to another, back in the shuffle. And all that was left were these, those two words together. I'm gone, and not really knowing his voice any anymore, except by the twang, how long lasting was his call at last. My father keeps a bird. 
And even so, his shadow comes this dark night when for two moments it doesn't rain and the moon pulls full. Knock, tap, tap, tap. Now grown unafraid, I go to the hall to greet the one who is calling, almost knowing it is my coming to meet him which will frighten him away. Perhaps the thought of a gust of wind from the opening swing of a door on firm hinges gives him the fear of being shooed off the porch like a neighbor's cringing dog. Perhaps he fears being flung back to the earth like a skinny worm, for he, for he is more slender now than the handle of a ladle or bow. Through the window I see him bow and withdraw, or even before, at the creak of the floorboards under my feet. He may have retreated without a word, thinner than a broomstick or lamp wick, afraid I'd say I didn't have room or time to spend, ashamed of the mending undone in his arms. He may have quickly slipped back into the damp blue night, not my father, not my father's bird, not my father's shadow, nor the shadow of his bird. We doing okay? Yeah. Before blooming, first eat the bread you were given, or it will mold, spoil, go stale, or crumble. Then study astronomy, or the alphabet, or the mouths of snails. Then glance out the window, see how the shadows compose themselves to sway and rest, then go out the door. Watch the water in the river tumble in its bed. Watch the leaves of trees emerge on the branch as small satin capes or trembling masks. Venture out further to the deciduous woods, bend down or kneel. Sip the dew from where it fell, between the leaves of wild leeks, then dig, find the globe, eat the world. Yeah. <laughs> eat the world. Angel, I saw an angel's body so long in length it was a river. Even later, I saw two ravens shove each other to lift and carry in their beaks the tip of the tapered hem of the angel's silky liquid slip. Incredible. The raven in flight pecked away at the moon each night until the light fell on the land, in the waters and waves, on the sea, on the river, on the sand, on trees, on leaves. At first, before it was conceived, the sea wore nothing. And then, when, no, when one night the sea was born, she was wearing so many slippers of light. Hmm. I'll read three more poems. Poem for Solstice, Summer. It starts with an epigraph or an old saying, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning, red sky at night, sailors delight. Hot pink, pink like a pink slip or hat, pink like a petal or a pebble, this pink rinsed air above the purple green trees and the rain fed yellow fields and green hills. And a moment ago, gone, as if it were summer, as if it were fall, as if it were a day cast in its own bright scales swimming over us. This fire, this full light taking shorter turns or less length, less breath, an elusive glow flitting through the sky? Or is it we who are turned from this light? The blue shade already wide, pulled long. This poem is um, called Wasps, and it is in memory of David Dellinger. Many heads nodding, knowing him as a serious um, nonviolent protester. That's his claim to fame. Chicago 7. He lived here. Huh? What's that? Chicago 7. What? He was one of the Chicago, Chicago 7. Chicago 7. And he lived here. What, what did Cora always claim she was? She was one of the something that she claimed she was. Chelsea 6. Chelsea 6. He lived here at the end of the year. Oh, he did. 
Yeah. Well, it was either the Chelsea Six or the Chelsea Yeah. Right. And he lived in the house my dad was born in. Wow. Okay. Real stories. <laughs> At the top of this poem, it says, to the editors. I don't know who she sent it to. It's called Wasps. In spring, wasps emerge from their hidden nests. Before flying, they move around inside a room as if they were monks and nuns, philosophers contemplating existence, being. When it rains, they touch each other in a corner where a window meets a sill. They rest there, still as pebbles. Often they keep their thin things to themselves. When they overhear the news of war from the radio, then one or two wasps show with their whole crisp bodies how the bombs drop. With open wings in demonstration, they fly to the ceiling. From there, they drop down and down and down, over and over, bombarding wall, window, floor. The other wasps turn away like a small banner of sorrow. They fold their wings to climb and pile on top of one another, to huddle, to hold, to weep. A long time ago, after Bishop, I remember feeling shame. I was like a boarded up house. I wanted to blaze. Then I went somewhere, or met someone, or saw something. I waited and felt. It seemed like an answer. It was not. It was more like a cloud or several clouds moving and changing their shapes. So I never knew what to call them. I tried digging in the earth and planting seed, but I was not a farmer. I was peculiar, even to myself. I kept myself paper thin. I wanted to be a kite, to fly high without wings, to flap and dive, but I wanted to be attached by a thin string or thread to your hand. I wanted you to set me loose, almost free, then pull me in, lay me down. In this last poem, um, I, I'm just going to read it. I have no ghost now, not attached nor clinging to my body, which is lighter than a falling leaf. The ghost is in my bed in my bedroom. I am in the hallway going into the bathroom. Ghost got up with me this morning, but left me, maybe as I was trying to change the time or the thermostat. Maybe she knew she was tired of holding on to th such a thin specimen of thread, at last invisible. Maybe she feared getting too warm or too cold, and maybe she feared love or wished to get rest. <laughs> rest. Thank you. Huh? And there's cake tomorrow. tomorrow. She, yeah, when she, um, when just, I was going to say one thing, I'm sorry. When she, when she was um, toward the end of her life, and, you know, many people got to spend time with her, and it was beautiful. Um, I asked her what was going to happen with the poems. What are going to happen? What's going to happen to all your poems? And um, I said, we need to have a reading. We need to, and so I promised her that we would have a reading around her birthday, and Chard had already back then agreed that he would do that. And for her to know that her poems were going to be honored by the Poet Laureate of Vermont was, I think, a really big deal. And so I'm really grateful to Chard for coming to, to do this and to give her a So thank you all for coming. Uh, as someone just announced, there is another celebration of Cora tomorrow night here at the library at 4 o'clock in the afternoon upstairs. And uh, there are pictures of her all around that room and some of her artworks as well. So I think that is the time that you will, any of you who can come, can share stories uh, and talk about, about your memories of Cora. Thank you again, Chard and Karen, for, for sharing uh, your readings with us tonight.